Hey you guys, welcome back to another session at Rachel's studio and today is a special day because I just found out that I qualify to monetize my channel now. That doesn't really mean a lot because you can't make a lot of money with just 3,000 subscribers even though that's amazing. In the YouTube world, that's tiny. <laughs> so it's not significant for me monetarily, it's just a really exciting milestone to reach. So I want to do something special. So I thought that I would share with you this tutorial that I'm doing for my students and I worked on it quite a bit this morning and got a lot done uh, with the first parts of the painting which include uh, getting it drawn, erasing it a little bit, putting on the masking, and doing the first washes and getting the first part of the eyes done. So I thought I would share that with you. Normally I would share um, that much information with only my Patreon students, but I wanna celebrate and I really appreciate all you guys out there that um, watch my videos and it means so much to me that you support me. So let's get started with this tutorial. So I got this orange marmalade kitty as a commission just a few weeks ago and I got it through Etsy. So that's another reason why it's so useful to have a lot of different subjects that you've painted and offer prints of them. Not because you're gonna sell a ton of prints, although I sell some, but the really good thing about having prints is that people find them and then they say, oh, that kind of looks like my cat, but I want my exact cat. And then they come in and they ask you to do a commission. So I get a lot of commissions that way. So anyway, I've got this painting all drawn out. I've got the cat drawn out and I just transfer it using a tracing method uh, up against a window basically. I trace it in either Photoshop or um, what is it called? Autodesk app. Um, that's a free um, app. And then I trace it in there and I can print it out. And then I trace it up against a window. And I highly recommend that when, especially when you're doing commissions, you don't want anything to look wonky when you're painting for someone. So um, this is a very typical way professional artists work is they trace. And it's not um, like cheating at all. It really isn't cheating. A lot of new people or people who don't understand art look at it as cheating. But once you get the first washes and you're not gonna be able to see the drawing anyway, it just serves as a very rough guide to get you started. And then I am masking the whiskers and I'm gonna mask the glint in the eyes and I dip my rigor brush in soap. First I dip it in water, scrub it in soap, and then pick up a little bit of masking. And so that helps protect the bristles from getting ruined. And then I painted my whiskers and I try not to just do straight lines, straight line. I try to break, put a break in some of the whiskers, um, just put the tip of one whisker, um, and have some variety in my lines to make the whiskers look more believable. So I'm just doing all my whiskers. There's a lot of whiskers in this kitty. <laughs> so I'm um, just getting those in and I'm using an old rigger that I don't really care about. I'd rather it not get ruined, but it's okay if it does. I use Winsor & Newton removable, get removable, removable masking. If you do get masking stuck in your brush, apparently you could use Goo Gone. Just a little tip there for you guys. So you could use that if you have to. And the thing with masking is when you're applying it to your painting, don't overdo it because you'll have to go in and scrub all that stuff later. So um, if you use too much masking, especially in the fur, it's gonna look too stilted and it's not gonna look good. And you're just gonna have to scrub it all out anyway. And by the way, use good paper, because if you don't, you cannot scrub your painting and get soft edges like how I do. You can't use my technique of scrubbing unless you use good paper. And by the way, I use Arches Cold Press 140 pound paper. That's what I use, but there's a lot of good cotton rag papers out there. Um, Fabriano um, makes a good one, uh, but I like Arches, that's my favorite. And here I'm just doing what I almost always do. My cat is biting my toe, stop. No kitty, no, she's so naughty. 
So anyway, the first thing I do in almost every painting, once I get all the masking done and you've got to let it dry, don't paint anything wet over masking that's not completely dry, but it doesn't take long to dry. So I paint clear water over the entire area where I'm going to paint, except for where I want to keep really pure color and or um, perfectly white paper. So um, the more little glints of white paper too, is just like little gems in your painting, it'll add a little sparkle. So try to leave some white paper here and there anyway. Um, whoa, there's my head. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm going to work in the upper right quadrant of this painting. So I wet the whole upper right quadrant, avoiding carefully the eye. I painted around the eye and some little um, hair textures along the edge of the cheek so that I could give myself an option to leave little white sparkles there if I decided that worked out with my painting. And then I'm going in, oh my goodness, my head is all up in there. Wow, look at that. Sorry. <laughs> um, for the background, I wanted to pretty much match the background to the eyes, so I used cerulean blue, um, Windsor green gold, and permanent green light. And those are the only three colors I used in the background. And you want to think in terms of not putting several colors next to each other, but kind of color blocking. Make this little area Windsor green gold, and this one's cerulean. And over here, you've got um, permanent green light, so that it just adds variety in different um, quantities too, like a little spot of cerulean, a big spot of Windsor green gold, and then a medium spot of um, permanent green light. Okay, then while it's still wet, I want this edge of the face, because it's receding, to be really soft. So I painted the cat's, the edge of the cat's face right up into my moist background, because I wanted it all kind of merged together a little bit, <laughs> not a lot. Um, so you really have to be careful to get your paint at just the right amount of moisture level, which is easier said than done. So yes, it takes practice. But the colors that I used in this marmalade tabby are burnt sienna and quin gold and ultramarine blue for the most part. Um, I love the burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and fur because they granulate, which means they get little textures in them from, it's almost like little sandy textures as they dry. That's what granulating paint is um, in a nutshell. So I use those a lot because I like how they granulate and form their own textures and they also are easy to um, scrub back if you make a mistake or you just want to soften things up. Okay, now my paper was getting too dry my edge was getting too stiff, so I went in with a uh, bottle of water and spritz, just a little tiny bit of spritz of water, almost mist, but with little droplets. You gotta find a um, spray bottle that has just the right amount of um, <laughs> droplets, so it can take some searching. Okay, now I'm doing the eyes, and they're just like little paintings, and I've explained these in other videos for um, the most part, but I, approach it the same way I do the rest of the painting. I get it moist with clear water first, and then I drop in different colors. And um, for these eyes, I used the same as in the background, Windsor Green Gold, Permanent Green Light, um, and Cerulean Blue. But for the top of the eye where it's really dark, I used some indigo. Okay, okay. <laughs> That was attractive, I'll have to edit that out. Okay, and then while it's fresh in my mind how I did that eye, I like to do the other eye. So I start with some Windsor Green Gold, I put in a little dab of permanent green light. Along the top is some indigo and that's all melting and merging together, but the amount of water on the paper is key. You can't have too much, you can't have too little. So it takes some practice. It has to be a little damp, but not too damp and not too dry. <laughs> so um, you'll, you'll, you'll have to practice with that, but you'll see what I mean when you try. But so that way for it to be a little damp, then all the colors, okay, Kitty, gosh, all the colors will merge together better and just make a really romantic looking soft eye that also holds some variety in the colors. Kitty, I need to brush you. You've got little knots, poor Kitty. 
she's getting so old. I've had her for years. And then when it's kind of getting to that stage where it's getting fairly dry, I like to mm -hmm. sometimes drop in a little, just a little tiny drop of clear water and make it cauliflower just a little to add some interesting texture. Once again, a good reason to use granulating paints because when you do that, um, it creates really interesting little textures and they cauliflower more interesting and that can make really interesting textures in the eyes. So um, that's how I get my eyes to look the way they do in this painting with a lot of variety and texture and um, color, but they do look like zombie eyes. We need <laughs> pupils. So I'm going to go in and all of a sudden I'm itchy. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm going to go in and put in the pupils. Now the pupils, you will like your results better if you can, it's hard because it's such a small area, but if you can get parts of your pupil lighter than other parts, you're winning because that will make it look more um, wet, moist, um, glisteny, and it would just make it look more dynamic and somehow it makes it look more alive. So here I pre-moistened the iris and then you can see I kept like the middles of them a little bit lighter and the edges or the two ends of the people really dark and then you can lift out a little bit um, if it gets away from you and I had to lift out a little bit um, or you can wait for it to dry some and then drop in a tiny little bit of clear water just a little bit to spread that dark out there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And then if you really want it to look um, painterly, you let it almost dry, and then you swish over like the top half with a little bit of clear water and blur just slightly parts of the iris to make it kind of attached to the eye. I know it sounds weird, but it really looks good. So I tried to do that. Mine was getting too dry, it looks like. But uh, here I'm doing the other iris and see how I'm getting part of it really dark and trying to keep the other part really light. And now in the reference photo, the iris is just perfectly black. There's not much variety. But as an artist, you can use your artistic license and knowledge to make an area more interesting and dynamic by having more than just flat, dark, black in an area. Usually just a flat dark black in any amount is going to get really boring really fast. So the more variety you can put in these areas, the better. Now I'm going to go and work over there on the eyebrow of that far right eye. And again, I'm moistening the whole area with my clear water carefully, not getting it too wet, not leaving it too dry. You got to let it just get just the right amount of moisture and sometimes you put your water on and you sit and you wait for it to dry a little bit. And then I'm going in and putting that cute little eyelash in. Our kitty eyelash is so cute. <laughs> so the eyelash is burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. And as it dries, I continue to go back in and darken the edge that's closest to the eye to get it really dark. And I think I went in and sprayed. And this is the thing when I work in an area like this and it's looking too still to dip sprite. Sure enough, I sped this up so much I have to talk fast. <laughs> but I covered the eye up because it was still a little moist so I didn't want to get spray on the eye so I cover the area up that I want to protect from the spray and then spray the somewhat damp painted area to loosen that painted area up just a smidge. I did the same thing with that cheek. That's how I got that cheek so soft looking. I was happy with that cheek. Yay. <laughs> and again, um, I'm putting in more eyeliner. And by the way, I don't think I mentioned this, I'm using a silver black velvet size eight brush. That's a squirrel hair brush. I got three for $45, so that's pretty darn cheap for a natural hair brush. And they have beautiful points on them. So, um, I'm really liking that brush and the point just now is starting to bend over a little bit so we'll see how well it holds up. All my other natural hair brushes don't hold up very long. So that's my favorite brush of the moment though is my size 8 silver black velvet brush. 
And I just went in and just did some really soft little eyebrows there. Oh, now I'm talking about, what was I talking about? Oh, I was talking about how if you are a stiff painter and you want to loosen up, but you just can't do it. And sometimes I'm right there with you, you guys. What you do is just paint your stiff little painting. And before it dries, just do it in sections, paint in sections so you can paint, loosen, paint, loosen. But anyway, you just spritz an area before it dries, but not when it's too wet. You gotta wait for the paint to dry to the point where if you spritz it, it just kinda has this nice little magical softening effect, but it doesn't bloom way out into this big blob of watercolor paint. So you do have to wait until your paintings just the right amount of dry. And I did that with that cheek and it really worked very well. I was so happy with it. And so here I'm going in and I'm putting in some eyeliner. Now that eye on the right isn't anywhere near done. I'll, I'll probably go in and darken that eyeliner. That is a trick to getting beautiful eyes is getting the eyeliner really dark, really, really dark. And make sure you have some complete whites, glints in the eye and then have your medium tones. So they're like little paintings Every painting should have medium, light, and dark values. Same with the eye. The eye should always have medium, light, and dark values. Same with the ears. Ears should always have medium, light, and dark values, almost always. They should always have that. And if you get a reference photo where it doesn't give you that information and you don't think you can make it up, it's not gonna be a good reference photo. All right, now I'm painting that little curve that comes off his eye and you see how I'm attaching it to the eye and making sure it blurs in with the eye and attaches. And this is where you'll find more success with your paintings as well, is if you can connect all the different little pieces, parts together as much as possible, it's like a law of the universe. Everything's connected. And if in painting you connect the disparate parts of your painting somehow as much as possible, it'll make it hang together so much better. So when I attached that little stripe and made it run right into the eye and right into the eyeliner under his eye, that is um, a point of attachment for that eye that's gonna help incorporate the eye into the painting by being attached to other elements in the painting. And the same goes for ears, noses, anything in the painting. If you're painting a tree, if you have to attach, you can't just put it in there like a stuck on tree. You need to attach it to the shadow underneath or the mountains behind or whatever. Attachment is key to getting your paintings looking more professional. All right, so then I did this little line and I used a technique, um, a lot of push technique. You gotta watch my push technique video so you know what I'm talking about, but it's where you put clear water up next to thick cream consistency paint and let them kind of intermingle just a tiny bit though and create interesting textures. And the first time I did that in this stripe, it bloomed out too much, so I had to let it dry and then go back in and then put more cream consistency drops of paint into the moist area. Let that dry some and then go in with little tiny, just not even drops, little bits of clear water and drop them here and there next to the cream consistency paint to create some texture. And the bottom of that stripe towards the bottom, that's exactly how I want it to look. That's the way it's supposed to look. but. Watercolor is not always predictable, so it doesn't always do exactly what you want it to do. So that's the other thing. You gotta let your painting do what it wants to do sometimes. <laughs> you can't force the issues sometimes, which can be very frustrating for us control freaks out there. Not that I'm one, but anyway. But see, this is looking pretty harsh, I know, because the rest of the cat isn't done. It's looking dark, but once I get in the rest of the values of this cat, that will balance out and look really good. And I wanted to do that stripe because I wanted to attach it to the eye while the eye was still wet. So that's why I painted that stripe at this time because I did that eye and I could see that that stripe needed to be attached to the eye. So I was like, well, I'll just go ahead and paint the whole stripe and attach it to that bottom eyeliner and the corner of the eye so that it kind of, it kind of um, hangs together well. And then I did the nose with a mix of naphthol red and quinacridone gold. And it's more pink on the top and orange on the bottom. And then 
as it goes further down towards the mouth, it turns purple. So I'll put in some Windsor Violet too. And the more that you can do while the whole nose is wet, so all these colors merge together just a little bit, but still hold their place in their own little spots, the better. And see, I'm attaching that nose to the mouth. So I paint the mouth along with the nose because I want that nose to di directly attach with a little line here down to the mouth. So I painted that all together at the same time so I can create attachment. Attachment is so important. Connection is so important. And then I'm just continuing to develop up the lights and the darks of the nose. And that's another place that you really wanna get dark, dark, dark is the little nose hole. So I'll work on that in a minute, but then I'm using um, some burnt sienna along the side of the nose to create some, um, some dimension in there. I'm using a mix of Windsor Violet and Burnt Sienna for the black of the nose. Or you could just use black, doesn't matter. Or you could use um, Ultramarine Blue and Burnt Sienna or Ultramarine Blue and Burnt Umber, Burnt Umber and Windsor Violet. All those would make really good darks. I do not like to use alizarin crimson and phthalo blues like some artists suggest because they're too staining. You can't scrub them. You are stuck with them. They are not fixable. So I don't use alizarin crimson and phthalo blues and greens hardly ever because they are so unforgiving. They're so powerful that um, I don't enjoy painting with them because I can't use any scrub techniques. They're, they don't really granulate. Um, I don't think alizarin Crimson is very light fast. Fellow blue probably is, but it stains the hell out of your painting. You can see it. This was getting a little bit um, too hard edged, so I went and sprayed this whole area. And that does look really dark, I know, but um, it'll, it'll look better when I get the rest of the cat in. And I can also scrub some of it. So anyway, that's how I started this painting. And let me see. And it's still... All this that I just did, I painted this morning, so the painting is still pretty much at that same stage. So, I this is my current project that I'm doing with my Patreon students, and that whole tutorial will be available soon, along with a ton of other tutorials. So you can go to my web website, Rachel Studio, if uh, if you want to see what tutorials are available and see if there are anything you're interested in, you can go to rachelstudio.com www.rachelstudio.com and then click on tutorials and then click on index to patreon tutorials and it will show you pictures of all the paintings that i've done that have full tutorials two hour or more long videos or tutorials in the most case which takes several videos i have to do session one two three and four five etc and you get free downloadable trace wools and the reference photo and you're allowed to sell your original, not prints, but the original. So you get all that when you join for just $5, but you really should join for 13 so you can get the paint dots. But anyway, I'm just so excited that I've reached this milestone of monetizing my channel. I'm not sure when I'll actually flip the switch on that. Um, it's not like I'm gonna make a lot of money with it, but it's just exciting to reach that milestone. And I really appreciate all you guys who helped me get there. So thank you so much to all of you who've been so supportive of this channel. I hope you'll subscribe if you're not already. Be sure to sign up for um, the notifications and I upload new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. So join me then and I'll see you in the next video. Bye you guys.